Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Buddhang saranang gachami, damang saranang gachami, sangang saranang gachami. Dutiampi buddhang saranang gachami, Dutiampi damang saranang gachami, Dutiampi sangam saranang gachami. Tatiampi buddhang saranang gachami, Tatiampi damang saranang gachami. Tatiampi sangam saranang gachami. So chanting the five precepts. And as we chant these, they're, they're articulated in a way which emphasizes the restraint, the non-harming, you know, that not to cause harm to other people, other beings. And we can also consider, as we chant, how kind of the, the positive, um, the, the cultivation of positive qualities. For, so, for example, when we, when we consider not taking what's not offered, we can think about, how can I share what I have? How can I be generous? Um, you know, how can I support life? Uh, how can I not only not lie, but also speak the truth with kindness and, and skill to, uh, to try to, you know, show up in the moment um, with, uh, as a presence of kindness and wisdom to the best of my ability. These these precepts are not at all about perfectionism or, or sin or, or guilt. You know, they're really training, um, training contemplations that we bring into our lives. Panati pata veramani sika Padam samadhyami Adina dana veramani Sika padam samadhyami Kame sumi chattara veramani Sika padam samadhyami Musawada veramani sika padam samadhyami. Sura Maria Maja Pamadatana veramani sika padam samadhyami. Idami sila maga fala nyanasa pachayo hotu. Sadu, sadu, sadu anumodami. I, I love that last word, anumodami. I rejoice because really these, these uh, precepts do bring joy when we can live in a way that our mind is not always filled with remorse, and we kind of have a sense that uh, even if 
even if we haven't been perfectly virtuous, uh, refrained from harm, uh, yet we've we've been bringing that into our lives with a with a clear intention. Hi, Anne. Uh, welcome. So, um, since September, in this group, we have been working our way through the Satipatthana Sutta, which is the four foundations or four establishments of mindfulness. And so, uh, every week, I've been dealing with a topic uh, through uh, the body and uh, and feeling tone and mental states and and now we're we're working through dhammas um, formations. It's a it's a word that's hard to translate dhammas, um, and uh, and so I'm beginning today with the seven awakening factors. Um, I'm actually going to, uh, yeah, I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to refer to this book uh, as I, I mentioned to people, you know, several times during the year that this is a book that I recommend. It's called uh, Satipatthana Meditation: A Practice Guide um, by Bhikkhu Analyo, and it's, um, I think, it's just a, a wonderful uh, book to um, uh, because it it's not he he is a both a scholar and a yogi a very deep meditator skilled meditator uh, in this book he's not that scholarly he doesn't have a lot of footnotes it's really focused on practice and he simplifies the the teachings uh, so that you know we can really have a a, a good sense of them to to bring them into our awareness, you know, throughout our lives, uh, throughout our day-to-day living. So, um, so the seven awakening factors uh, are, and I think we're going to be ending the season because uh, my last teaching will be on July 9th. Um, and, uh, and so the seven awakening factors uh, are... Uh, mindfulness, uh, investigation of dhammas, energy, uh, joy or rapture, sometimes it's called, tranquility, concentration, and equanimity. Uh, and mind, and and they're kind of divided into um, two, well, three groups. Uh, well, first of all, mindfulness, it's not a group, but mindfulness is the first of the awakening factors. And it's kind of the gateway to all of the others because mindfulness is key. Um, mindfulness is being present, attentive, non-reactive in the way that we are uh, paying attention in our moment-to-moment living uh, and so, um, so mindfulness, it's like the doorway to all the others. And then the three first ones are called the, the energizing factors because they, they help to uh, kind of bring us into practice, you know, when we are, uh, when the energy is, is low, so so only one of them is called energy, but they all do energize us. And so investigation um, and, and energy and joy uh, help to uplift us. And then when we're scattered and we may have too much energy or, or, or our energy is, uh, is not really um, focused, uh, then uh, we, we can... Uh, co- bring calmness or tranquility and concentration, collecting the mind 
and, uh, and equanimity. So, so over the next weeks, we're going to be looking at those. Um, I'm going to be talking today about mindfulness and investigation. And we've been talking for quite a while about mindfulness, so, so I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not going to uh, talk a lot about it. Um, but I was looking in preparation at um, Bhikkhu Nalyu's text here, and he talked about it in some, uh, some interesting ways. Well, first of all, uh, just uh, before I talk about mindfulness per se, um, when we talked about the hindrances, we talked about being aware, the hindrances, you know, being those factors which uh, hinder our capacity to stay attentive and present and to collect our attention. So, so hindrances are also opportunities. And, and that's the way I think it's important to, to understand them, that, that when we encounter a hindrance, such as, such as sense desire or anger or, or confusion, it's not, it's not a bad thing and, and you know, that we need to uh, get rid of it. What's important and actually great is that we're aware of it. We, we're mindful of it. And so, um, and so, you know, when we practice the hindrances, you know, that we practiced, when we practiced, you know, working with the hindrances, we practiced, first of all, recognizing that it was present. So that's really important to recognize that it's present, to recognize, oh, I'm caught up in wanting something, you know, and my, I'm totally preoccupied. My mind is, you know, in fantasy worlds about wanting something. Or, or in a drama about being angry with somebody. Uh, so, so recognizing. And then we brought investigation to the noticing of the hindrance, uh, um, to the, noticing what are the conditions that gave rise to it. And then we, uh, we brought skillful means which could be just um, letting, you know, letting go in the sense of that knowing that we are hooked and knowing that that is creating suffering for us is, a, um, uh, is conducive to letting go of the hindrance. So you know, I realized, oh, I'm caught in anger and that is, this is really painful. Uh, and the you know and and what gave rise to it was a thought, or a memory, or um, a sound, you know that reminded me of something, and so you know seeing how conditions give rise to s- states of suffering, uh, and and that the state of suffering is so is itself so painful, and. And essentially, we don't want to suffer. We want, we want to be at peace, and we want what is, uh, what is good for ourselves. So that helps us to dis, to let let go of the hook, to to let go and um, uh, and come back, come back to this present moment, and that brings a sense of joy. So coming back can bring a sense of joy, and so there we, you know, we've we've uh, we've applied the first factors because uh, you know with, with investigation and the letting go, it, it's kind of bringing energy and focus to our experience, and then and then joy arises as we let go and come back to mindfulness in the, of the present moment. So, so, so in the cultivating of these awakening factors, what's really important is that we come to understand what gives rise to them. And, um, uh, no, first of all, I, sh- I should say that we come to recognize them and, and, and also understand what gives rise to them. So, so 
when we recognize, oh, you know, when I, when I sat down and I ate my breakfast this morning, I, I wasn't all caught up in, you know, thinking about what I have to do today. I actually, you know, was paying attention to eating my breakfast and, uh, and enjoying my breakfast. Um, and, uh, and I didn't, you know, just look down and say, oh, where did my breakfast go, you know? Uh, so, uh, so noticing mindfulness and noticing um, that, that that quality of mindfulness is something that is a beautiful quality that, we, that brings enjoyment. Um, So recognizing and, and noticing what gives rise to it. So what gives rise, the first kind of, um, in most basic way, we cultivate uh, or, or a condition that gives rise for that awakening factor to continue to arise is to cultivate it. So... Uh, that's a kind of a convoluted sentence, so I'm sorry about that, but um, I'll say it again more simply. So, the arising of mindfulness, most basically, is, is caused by cultivating mindfulness, the remembering to cultivate mindfulness. And, um, and we, can, we can do that by... Um, you know, in many, many ways, uh, Thich Nhat Hanh talked about putting little notes around, you know, on your dresser, on your mirror, you know, sati, sati, remember. Sati is the Pali word for mindfulness, and it, it has this sense, you know, often teachers will just use the word sati rather than mindfulness, because sati is a, is a more embodied, it, it, connotes a more embodied sense, we, to remember, to we, the, member, the members of our body, the, the parts of our body, you know, like feeling ourselves sitting on a cushion or a chair, you know, and we might just feel it and remember to feel it. Or breathing, you know, just feeling the breath. And we remember that here we are, I'm breathing, I'm alive, I'm here. Breathing in, uh, I know I'm alive. Breathing out, I share my life with the world. This is the kind of uh, couplet that Thich Nhat Hanh used to uh, create to, um, to, to bring mindfulness into our moment-by-moment living. So, um, so uh, there was one uh, thing that Analyo Bikunalyo said about um, mindfulness that I thought was a, a nice a mnemonic. Um, he he said uh, uh, the flavor of the awakening factor of mindfulness during actual practice could be summarized as its sap. So, you know, thinking of sap as as kind of what brings uh, life and nourishment through the tree. And a summary based on combining the first letters of the following three qualities. Soft, awake, and present. Soft, awake, and present. So I liked that... um, little mnemonic. Um, so what does soft connote uh, to you when I, you know, if, if, if the mind, the body can be soft, you know, it's, it's undefended, it's, it's relaxed, um, there's a quality of openness. Uh, you know, I remember when I first began practicing mindfulness and um, 
and I began to bring mindfulness into the body, and I was recognizing how tight the body was, how contracted it was, and, and also the mind, because as I would sit in meditation, and I would become aware that the mind was caught up in some thinking, maybe judging, self-judging, judging others. And then the mind would kind of slam shut, (laughs) like the door would slam shut, you know, because I wanted to reject that uh, mental state or that mental activity of judging or wanting. So... So when the mind is soft, it means it's relaxed and open and uh, not reactive and uh, awake. So, yeah, paying attention, not falling asleep, not drifting and present. So that quality of presence is, is something that uh, implies that we're engaged we're paying attention, you know, we're, we're showing up again and again and again in each moment. And it does require, you know, this is where energy comes in. It does require a sustained energy because, you know, I mean, I, I notice, you know, say, for example, someone, you know, I'm listening to something, um, on like a, a talk or something or um, and I notice oh I tuned out <laughs> tuned out for the last five seconds or whatever and so so that that's mindfulness um, being awake and bringing that presence uh, back into my engagement with listening to the talk or a conversation with a friend. Um, yeah, sometimes even when somebody's sitting in front of you, you know, and, and all of a sudden you realize, oh, I, I'm not there. Uh, so so we, uh, we wake up and we re-engage. We bring the, that presence uh, back into the moment. So soft, awake, and present. And so investigation is, um, it, it really goes together with mindfulness. You know, they, they, they really work together, um, kind of like our legs work together walking. Um, as I become mindful of something, so say, I become mindful of, of a hindrance. Um, uh, say, I notice that, you know, I notice some thoughts. So the thoughts are going, you know, and there's a little story going in the mind. And it's a story of anger or irritation or, you know, not liking something that somebody did or said. And then, and then there's a a kind of a mindful moment of recognizing. So there's the recognition that a hindrance is present. And, um, and so, um, so there's a turning toward and that turning toward, uh, to understand that turning toward with curiosity and interest, that's the quality of investigation. So rather than pushing it away, which is, you know, when I first began meditation practice, that's what I would do. I'd say, oh, that's bad. You know, I'm meditating. I don't want to do a bad thing. I don't want to get caught up in bad bad kind of energies. So let's come back to the breath, you know, close the door, come back to the breath. No, it's actually, what is this? What is this uh, energy of 
irritation, of ill will. And, uh, and so, first of all, the most basic and accessible way to investigate something that's happening that we're becoming mindful of is to notice it in the body. So noticing how, how, is, how is the body holding this experience, this arising of ill will? And how is it feeling energetically? <clears throat> And it feels yucky. <laughs> it feels, uh, it feels uh, contracted. It feels separate. It feels uh, like I need to defend myself. Like I need to push that person away or, or do something to, to change them, to correct them, to, <laughs> to bring them into line with what I want them to be. And so immediately there's the, there's the script for suffering, right? Um, and so um, so that investigation um, brings us into the nature of the experience, which is suffering. And, and as we investigate it, we, uh, we recognize that it has arisen from conditions. It allows us to, to gain insight into the nature of it. It's arisen from conditions such as, you know, a thought arising or, you know, maybe from another hindrance arising, like wanting something, uh, wanting our life to be something that we imagine would be a better life. Um, so it's not that we shouldn't aspire to for transformation, for for um, development as a human being, development in wisdom, development in in skills, but but the not wanting to be who we are and rejecting that and or not wanting our life as it is and th- judging it and rejecting it and thinking it needs to be something else is not a way to to orient ourselves towards transformation. It's it's just creating a sense of suffering. So investigation in the body, noticing, noticing uh, how we're experiencing something. And we can also be, become mindful that we're experiencing something which is um, joyful, which is pleasant, which is generous. We can notice you know, an impulse of compassion, a kind of a movement of the heart to open in compassion and generosity. Uh, And we can bring, you know, our, our mindfulness to that as well. And a kind of investigation in the sense that we notice that it's not suffering, that it is uh, a a quality of of joy and um, it's a spiritually pleasant experience. So mindfulness, so, so in, in cultivating the awakening factors, so I, I was talking about how we use the awakening factors to, um, to work through a hindrance that's arising. And so in cultivating the, way, the awakening factors, there's a kind of a meta- quality, um, not meta like Facebook and not meta like the hard quality of meta, but meta meaning the on top of a uh, noticing on top of the, the actual practice that I'm noticing either in the moment or afterwards how mindfulness was so helpful in 
helping me to move through suffering. I'm noticing how investigation was um, came into play that I, I that the mind was curious that the mind turned toward the experience rather than uh, closing the door on the experience or turning away from it. And so recognizing that these awakening factors are present is really important. Uh, you know, and it's actually okay to give ourselves a little, you know, kind of a pat on the back or, a, you know, a little, yay, yay, great, you know. Uh, it, because it's not about a self. It's about recognizing that the Dharma is working in our lives. The Dharma is kind of unfolding and that we are engaging in our Dharma practice. So it's like, yay, uh, that's great. Um, and that's a, a kind of a joy that we can take in um, in you know, recognizing that we've actually taken refuge in the Dharma, you know, in that moment uh, where the Dharma is unfolding in our lives. So it's not about a self. It's not about an ego, although certainly the ego will jump in, you know, and say, wow, I'm really a good Dharma practitioner, aren't I? You know, I'm getting good at this stuff. Uh, you know, well, maybe I'll be teaching soon, or, you know, maybe everybody will come to see how wise I am. And, uh, so all of the ways that the mind ch- constructs a self and uh, jumps in and, you know, runs away with it. But, but then we can recognize that that's what's happening. There's an ego construction going on, and you can say, ah, yeah, I know that one. <laughs> We can uh, just smile, smile at it. So let's let's bring that into our practice today. Um, that we'll, you know, just again and again, mindful, and then bringing that turning toward the experience, and um, and then next week. I actually won't be teaching. Um, Cynthia Davis will be teaching, who has often come to this group, and she's, uh, she's uh, also a teacher, and she will be talking about energy. Uh, so it will be on- online only, though, um, not in person. She lives in Fredericton. <laughs> and, um, and so, uh, so, but... But in the application of investigation of dhammas, there, we do need energy. We do need to kind of, you know, okay, let's keep looking. Let's keep looking. Let's not look away. Let's not get distracted because it's unpleasant to look at how ill will or to feel into ill will and how it lives in the body and how, what, you know, what the body feels. Uh, so we bring energy to it to to kind of again and again um, show up with that curiosity and interest. So let's take a moment to uh, take a stretch or a um, uh, just relax, change your posture uh, before we meditate. We'll be meditating for 30 minutes. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to model so you all feel free to get up here and stand up and stretch your legs if you want to.
So let's begin our practice by, first of all, bringing our mindfulness into the body, feeling the body sitting on the earth. Feeling the breath in the body. So you might notice the breath in a particular place, in the nostrils, in the in the chest, in the belly. And that can be helpful to collect your attention. If the attention is scattered and going into past and future, or into fantasy, into inner dialogue, just collecting the attention into the breath, wherever you happen to feel it. Or if the breath is not so accessible to you, um, just collecting the attention around the the touch places of where your body is in contact with the earth or where the body is, uh, the hands perhaps are resting on the lap, those touch points. You might bring awareness to sound, rising and falling, maybe very subtly. And noticing that sound is happening within, actually. It's happening in the body. We have a sense that sound is happening out there, but sound is actually happening As we talked about last week, when we were talking about consciousness, sound is actually happening in the sense organ and in sense consciousness. The vibrations are reaching the inner ear and signals are being sent to the brain and consciousness of sound arises within the body. And I invite you, as you feel um, the mind and body are becoming more settled, more collected, that you widen your attention to the whole body. So abiding mindfully with a sense of the whole body Now, however you experience that, it doesn't need to be perfect. Like, you may, as you bring mindfulness to the body, you may experience that some parts of the body feel in shadow, there's not a sense of it, maybe there's a numbness. But numbness is also another way of experiencing the body.
So letting the breath be like a drum beat in the background and allowing the mindfulness to be in the embodied presence. Mindful of the body in the body. are the words from the Satipatthana Sutta. And breathing in, I experience the whole body. Breathing out, I experience the whole body. Are the instructions from the Anapanasati Sutta. Mindfulness of breathing. Touching into the softness of the body. So letting the body be soft, letting the body be relaxed letting the body be open, undefended. And so we can notice in the body, are the eyes staring even if they're closed? Letting the eyes be soft and relaxed? Is the heart contracted? Letting the heart be soft and contract and and relaxed. Letting the belly be soft and relaxed. So going through the the mnemonic device that uh, Analyo suggested, soft and awake is the next one. So awake has a certain element of energy, attention. And present. So I'm engaged. When we're present, we are remembering. We're remembering to pay attention. We're remembering what's happening. And then bringing, as we practice, the awakening factor of investigation to what is arising. So if it's simply breathing in and breathing out, we may be bringing that quality of interest and curiosity to the texture of the breath. to the way that the breath arises and manifests and passes away and to the moment of pause before the next breath arises. We might notice if the breath is contracted, tight. And so noticing mindfulness Mindful investigation notices 
these qualities without judging, without preferring, but just gives the space and attention for each moment's experience to be known. And we may notice what's happening in the mind. If the mind maybe is sluggish, maybe there's a a kind of a dullness in the mind or a scatteredness in the mind. Or maybe there's a preoccupation, some thought that keeps coming back or something you saw on TV or or a conversation that you had. So investigation is noticing what's happening in the mind. And since mind and body are not two, mind and body are intimately and inextricably connected, when we notice what what happens in the mind, we also notice what's happening in the body. And as we bring our attention our presence, our engagement to this experience of the moment? How do we notice that it changes? So invite, I invite you to work with these practices uh, as seems appropriate to you for the rest of our sitting.
As we come to the end of our formal practice, I invite you to recollect the moments of letting go, the moments of recognizing, the moments of insight into suffering and the causes of suffering, the moments of joy, peace, metta, compassion toward your own being and others. Many beautiful blessings of our practice that nourish our hearts, nourish our spirit, and help us to continue on the path. And as you recollect these blessings, the the goodness of your practice, I invite you to share these blessings with those in your life that come to mind, perhaps someone who is struggling in some way or someone who is blossoming in some way and you you want to bring nourishment to their joy and their evolution as a human being to those perhaps non-human beings that are suffering in the wildfires and in other contexts May our practice and our lives serve and support the happiness, well-being, and liberation of all beings.